So several people have asked me about this 944 project in my garage. This uh, belongs to a friend of mine and I'm helping him out. We are doing an LS3 conversion and a 944 turbo wide body uh, race chassis. So it does, it is a wide body. It does have fiberglass fender flares front and rear, which will allow us to put really wide tires on it. Um, this originally was a very high power uh, three liter turbo but um, the engine blew up, he got the car with a blown up engine, and we decided that LS3 power was what it needed. So I thought I would point out a few of the, the things and the hurdles that we're dealing with, and I'll try to keep people updated. So you can see the LS3 is you know, physically in place. Um, I'm working on the wiring harness right now. We've got our fuel line plumbed up to it. Um, one thing we did is we switched the, the fuel rail Originally the the fuel input side was on the other side, but it, it was a um, Symmetrical part so we were able to just uh, turn it around and change it over We do have a fuel pressure sensor on the back of the fuel rail there um, This is a drive-by-wire car So it's just got a servo actuator for the throttle body as opposed to a conventional uh, you know butterfly with a with a wire to the throttle cable that goes to it. You know, it still has um, a conventional throttle body, right? It's just um, that it's computer controlled. So the ECU will give it, you know, open it at however much the, the ECU decides. And one of the inputs will be the, the throttle pedal application. Um, we are running power steering. This is the power steering reservoir right here, and we are going to put a power steering cooler in place. That's one of the next steps there. We are running the factory coolant tank, coolant expansion tank, and we are running a, a pretty high zoot, thick, um, thick core uh, radiator to handle the heat load of the LS3. Uh, a few other things to note, uh, which I'll get into later is this is a dry sump engine so we have an extra belt coming off the front that's running a, a dry sump pump i don't know if it's focusing there we go so that's the dry sump uh, pump down in the bottom there and the belt running it one of the challenges is um, the power brakes the brake booster which goes kind of right in that opening that hole there doesn't fit with the with a v8 engine um, this bank of cylinders is right where that, that booster needs to be. There are some kits that allow you to kind of relocate the factory master cylinder without the booster, but that takes an awful lot of pedal pressure to, to actuate. So what we've done here is I took out the fuse box area and kind of the top of the, uh, the, where the HVAC was, and I, I fabricated up mounts so we could put a Tilton um, uh, multi-reservoir pedal box in. So I'm just gonna walk around and show you what it looks like from inside. So you can see the, the pedals are there. So the gas pedal is actually, uh, you know, elect electronic, right? It's just, um, uh, it's an e-gas, so it has a plug on it. And then we've got our, our clutch and our brake pedals. And the way this goes, the brake pedal actually has this balance bar here and it goes to two different master cylinders and one for the front and one for the rear. And you can size those master cylinders specifically for the calipers and uh, the right bias that you want. This should be able to give us um, a good pedal feel and not require as much pedal effort as if we had tried to use the factory master cylinder without the booster. And then this third master cylinder on the side is actually for the clutch. So, you know, the clutch pedal, when you push the clutch, it's gonna push that one, and this lead is gonna go down to the, uh, uh, the clutch slave cylinder down at the bell housing. And so these two hoses that come off of the, uh, the brake master cylinders are gonna go to the are going to go to fittings in the in the bulkhead here, and this actually goes to the factory ABS system, which is here in the wheel well, and 
then you know control all the brakes. So we are trying to keep a factory ABS system, but with uh, the the manual non non boosted brakes. This is a brake bias valve that the previous owner put in, and I think we're just going to leave that in the fully open position um, because we will be able to change bias. Not only you know major changes in bias, you can change the master cylinder, but we can fine tune the bias. We're going to have a control knob hooked up to this this threaded rod in the middle and so there's a bearing in here so as this bearing as you turn this threaded rod this bearing moves in and out in here and it will apply more pressure to one master cylinder and the other based on leverage so when you push this pedal down like right now you can see how it's adjusted this master cylinder pushes more when I push this back this bar tilts a little bit and then we have our brake light switch right there. So, you know, once you start pressing the pedal, the brake light switch is actuated. We've just painted the roll cage green. I think it's going to look good with the black. We have our rear stays here going into the trunk. We're going to make a sheet metal cover for the tank here in the trunk. And then we also have this round tank at the back, which uh, is, a, is a surge tank or holds a little bit more fuel. The driver's side has a NASCAR bar that kind of bows out. That gives a little bit more room to the driver. There is, of course, a, a dash bar that goes right under the steering column. Um, the mounting bars for the brake pedals connect to that dash bar. And then there are little diagonals that go down into the, the foot well for foot protection. Here's another view of the, uh, the kind of the pedal box area from the other side of the car with the gas pedal, the brake, and the clutch. On the passenger side of the car, there's just a simple X bar for the door, and then there's that box, that aluminum box, uh, where the back seat was. That is for the oil tank, the dry sump oil tank, so we can hold uh, enough oil capacity for the engine. For the fuel system, we are running the factory tank, the 21-gallon tank. We do plan to use this car for some endurance racing and we've got two fuel pumps mounted up there and then we've got that uh, round green surge tank so the idea is the one fuel pump will pump fuel from the factory tank to the surge tank and then there will be a return line the line coming out of the top of the surge tank returns to the factory tank and then the second fuel pump pumps out of the bottom of the surge tank pumps to the uh there's actually a a fuel regulator mounted a fuel regulator filter mounted right there kind of in the factory location and then the return from that goes back to the surge tank and then the output from that goes forward to the engine pretty massive four inch exhaust tip muffler four inch pipe going to a Y coming out as three inch pipes going to flex pipes uh, and we have our oxygen sensors right after the flex pipes and then from the flex pipes going to uh, the collector and then going to the to the header um, this side might be a little easier to see yeah so there's the flex pipe to the collector and then from the collector to the to the header to clear the hood on an LS3 conversion the engine has to be mounted very low to the to the cross beam to this uh, subframe here that holds the steering rack. They do make low profile oil pans um, that you know are very low over the over the subframe and then just have a little bit of a of a sump back here. But those do do not hold a lot of oil. They only hold about three, maybe four quarts of oil. So that's not a whole lot of oil to lubricate uh, a car for endurance racing where we're not going to, you know, stop for oil changes or things like that. And so we and also for oil cooling, we want to carry a uh, high volume of oil and also to prevent any oil starvation. So this is a dry sump oil pan. It's a very shallow pan. And what it has is it has these kind of pickup points. It has a pickup point in the front. And it also has pickup points in, in the rear. And what this allows us to do is to suck or, you know, pull oil out of that pan from multiple places. That all goes to this pump 
right here. So this pump has three feeds in, three suction feeds in. This pump is belt driven off of our crank pulley uh, and it's like a geared belt so that it can't slip or anything. So that um, oil pump is, is uh, sucking from three locations and then it's pumping all of that oil to the tank that was in the back seat and then it's pulling fresh oil from the tank uh, in the back seat to an oil cooler and then to the engine feeding into the engine back here at the, at the bottom of the oil pan. So this is the feed into the engine. So it goes into the engine, back to the pan, is sucked out in three places, pumped to the oil sump tank, pulled from the oil sump tank, goes through a cooler and a filter, and then back into the engine. The power steering rack is so close to the bottom of the oil pan, I actually had to make some little notches some, to, uh, to make clearance for the power steering rack mounts. So we had to do that on both sides of the, of the oil pan. And also, um, I replaced the rigid, um, ho the rigid lines from the power steering rack with flexible lines, which give me a little bit more maneuvering room to get them around that, that very low oil pan. The oil comes from the oil tank on this bottom line. This loops down and goes into the, the oil pump. From the oil pump, it comes out to the oil filter housing. From the oil filter housing, it loops back around to the bottom of the oil cooler. It comes up to the top of the oil cooler, and then from the top of the oil cooler, it goes down to the engine. That way it'll, it'll purge any air in the system. You always want to feed an oil cooler from the bottom and draw from the top. That way any air doesn't get trapped in there and you get maximum cooling ability.